let us pray. God of comfort, hope, and peace, as December days grow shorter and the nights grow longer, come quickly to our aching souls. Prepare a new path in our tattered lives. Turn us away from the mundane and meaningless. Open our ears that we may hear your word and our eyes that we may see your coming, that with humble and repentant hearts, we might look with joy to your advent among us and welcoming your Emmanuel, God with us, into our midst. Amen. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Comfort, comfort ye my people, be ye peace, the steps of God. Every valley shall be exalted. A voice in the wilderness, let it be heard. Advent is a season of hope and waiting. Anticipation. Anticipation is making me late. It's keeping me waiting. So many sermon song possibilities <laughs> on this second Sunday in Advent. Which one to go with? The 40th chapter of First Isaiah is filled with imagery and language which we have incorporated into the narrative and hymnody, hymnody of the birth of the Christ. Later this afternoon, my husband and I will attend the Portland Baroque Orchestra's annual rendition of George Frederick Handel's Oratorio Messiah, based on the writings of many of the scriptural prophets from our Hebrew sacred writings. At our scripture reflection group this past Wednesday evening, we explored how some of this Advent imagery can lead us to co-opting the narrative of other cultures and negating the truth of those writings to the original audiences for which they were crafted. Over the centuries, the dominant culture of Western Christianity has shaped its narrative of the coming of the Messiah on the texts and narratives of our spiritual ancestors in the faith tradition of Jesus of Nazareth, that is of the Jewish people and their culture and sacred texts. Here is the truth as I understand it, my friends. The Hebrew prophet Isaiah had no particular insight into the events that would happen 900 years after his death in the areas of the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. Yet, here we are in the observation of the advent of our God with us, our Emmanuel. It is the season of gift giving, replete with all of the harried and phonetic preparation and anxiety, which has come to be associated with that season in our 21st century consumer culture. Television, radio, and now even movie theater advertising promises us completion and satisfaction if we will only buy this or receive that consumer product, which is sure to make us smell better or look shinier or more dazzling to our jealous neighbors and friends. Into the midst of this consumer madness, the church calls us to remember what this time of preparation and anticipation is truly all about. Advent is the very antithesis of our capitalistic consumer culture. Advent calls us to seek out the true and humble roots of our gift giving and decoration preparation. The Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church defines Advent as from the Latin Adventus coming, that is of Christ, 
The season is observed as a time of preparation, not only for Christmas, but also for the second coming of the Christ. In my youth, the season was penitential in scope, and the observance was almost viewed as a little Lent. I think we can easily see that the church was wise in reviewing and adapting that focus after the many changes and modernizations of our liturgical traditions following the ecumenical liturgical movement of the Second Vatican Council. Advent is viewed in these newer, or rather returned to older, understandings of its focus as a time of preparation and anticipation, rather than penitence and fasting. The liturgical color of blue was introduced in the Sarum Rite, or use of the Roman Catholic liturgy, present at the Cathedral of Salisbury and spreading throughout all of England, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales by the middle of the ninth century of the Common Era, through the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. The Episcopal Church in the United States, as well as several other churches of the Anglican Communion, adopted the use of Sarum blue as an alternative to the penitential pur purple, which had been prevalent throughout most of the liturgical churches in the Advent season. The use of this richer and po possibly more royal color can help us to focus from our, our attentions on the coming of the anointed one among us, formerly seen as a king and reinterpreted in our culture and context as God's dominion or reign come among us in the right here. And the right now. Into the middle of this struggle between the consumer culture of consumption and instant gratification and the advent themes of preparation and expectation comes the wild man of today's gospel story. The baptizer, John. Dressed in camel's hair and a leather belt and eating locusts and honey comes this prophet and problem child of Judah who preaches of forgiveness of sin and repentance. It is no wonder that modern day Madison Avenue doesn't put John on Christmas pajamas and coffee mugs. <laughs> Yet the author of Mark's version of the gospel narrative begins with this wild eyed and odd desert dweller. This countercultural icon of wrath and redemption, who is nothing like the shepherds and angels or magi and mangers of the author of Matthew or Luke Acts telling of the incarnation story. This John is jarring and strange, and we would probably just as much prefer, thank you very much, to leave his protestations and warnings out of our nice little version of babies and mangers and angels tidings of good news and great joy. John, however, will not be so easily dismissed. John will proceed as did the prophets of old before to warn and chide, to stir and cajole our hearts of comfort and joy into a true understanding of the long expected one who is to come among us and fulfill God's promise of renewed covenant and new life and birth in water and Holy Spirit. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where we ought to be, and when we find ourselves in the place just right, we'll be in the valley of love and delight. This baptizer John calls us all into the wilderness and asks us to consider the differences between the gift giving of our consumer culture and the advent of expectation and preparation for the one who is to come, for the word made flesh who will dwell among us. One of the words which John uses is repentance. And that word has a certain connotation and meaning in our minds. I believe that we are called to a deeper understanding of that particular word. As it has come down to us in our modern culture, the word repentance may have certain baggage which comes along with it. 
Yet the Greek word translated here as repentance has a much deeper and more nuanced meaning if we look at it. The Greek word is metanoia, which is perhaps better translated as a change of mind or a change of direction. John calls out as prophesied, a voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. John refuses to go away. John bellows from the margins into our fast-paced lives, determined to have our attention. From the wilderness, John calls, waiting to gain our undivided and rapt attention, his gravelly and husky voice booming down the halls of our history and the history of all of God's people. Change your minds, change your direction, and follow the one who will fulfill the deepest promises of your heart's desire. The gift which John proclaims has nothing to do with sparkling diamonds and glittery wrappings. The gift which John proclaims will be wrapped in torn bands of cloth and placed in a feeding trough for sweaty livestock. Yet this gift, will be the greatest which we can ever contemplate receiving. This is the gift which we have been anticipating from the very moment of our presence on this planet, the reunion with our God among us, our Emmanuel, our long expected one. This Advent season then will become for us a time of anticipation and expectation not for the riches and gold which our world proclaims as valuable, but rather for the hopes and promises which our God declares are of ultimate value, as in feeding the hungry, and clothing the naked, as in comforting the grieving and freeing the imprisoned, as in loving our neighbors as we ourselves are loved by the one whose coming or advent we await. While our consumer culture will attempt to rest our spirits and wallets toward all that glittery gold, John will attempt to rest our hearts and souls toward the simple wooden structure of a manger, filled with more promise than any of our beautifully wrapped boxes from Neiman Marcus could ever be. It is in that manger that the true promise of Christmas awaits. Still distant and vague, in the harried and shortened days of December, yet sure and certain as the light which will return and lengthen in the days following the solstice. It is in our hearts and our minds that the birth of the long-awaited one will help us to change our minds and change our direction, to repent and hear the good news which the author of Mark's gospel so boldly proclaims in the prologue which we hear this morning. Let us prepare in our hearts to be the manger into which the promised one will be born with the metanoia which the wild man John calls us to. Barbara Stefana Germain suggests how we might do this in her poem titled On Being a Manger. And she writes, be empty, be sturdy, be soft inside, be still, be ready. Amen.